This is an interview with James Jim Knowles for the Oral History Project of the East Ham Historical Society, and it's taking place in Jim's childhood home in East Ham. The date is October 26th, 2023, and the interviewers are Rick Lindholm and myself, Marka Daly. Rick. Okay. Uh... Jim, um, tell us when you were born and, okay. and where. Okay. Well, I was born May 16, 1941, Highness Hospital, and then I may be back here for the next 21 years as I grew up, going to school through grammar school and high school. Um, I'm part of the Knowles family, a descendant of Richard Knowles, who was one of the original settlers of East Ham in 1647. Uh, he was in East Ham. He had two sons, the oldest which was John. I'm a descendant from, from John. And the interesting thing there was when the King Philip War began and they attacked Taunton, yeah. one of the, pe the only two people killed at the centuries, and one of those was John Knowles. So I have a descendant of someone wow. killed by the Indians on Cape Cod. Where we're sitting today is right in the middle of a, almost a Knowles colony for half, three quarters of a mile up and down the road. These are all Knowles houses back in the 80s. We can start down at the Peniman House, 1850 or so. Mrs. Peniman was a Knowles. Coming this way next door, where Della Maycumber lived, which we'll mention later, <laughs> or her sister was a Knowles, or married a Knowles, and that was John Knowles. He was a fairly wealthy man in those days. He owned from that house all of the land all the way across to the bay. So it was a sizable portion. Uh, my father built this house in 1939. Having grown up 100 yards away in the house next door, uh, which his father, James P. Knowles Sr., uh, got from his father, who was uh, Freeman Knowles. Uh, Freeman had initially lived in a house on the other side of that next to the cemetery a house built in the 1700s, I'm not sure what it was. Yeah. And he left that to his son, Freeman Knowles Jr. Uh, who had, and that was the house where Nettie Knowles lived and had the birthing service. Yes. Which in those days, the women got to go and stay for two weeks, which was <laughs> like a vacation before they went home. That house now is located down at the end of Hoffman Lane was actually moved there by one of the people that was born in the house, one of the Quinn boys right, moved yes. it down there and resettled it. Going further up the road, there was a George Knowles and a Walter Knowles and a Raymond Knowles, all houses wow. along the highway going back up to where Frank Lincoln's house was. And I think he has, his wife, I think, was related to a Knowles. So it was quite a stretch in, for many years. Interestingly, all these people built along the highway. Nobody built on the land overlooking the cove. <laughs> they all built up here, away from the water. Yeah. So that was quite interesting. Let's say my father built this house in 1939. Uh, he was, I guess, 38, 39, was married in 39, and I was born in 41. My first memories are of my father going away to war. He went to boot camp and came home. And then what I remember is we went down to the post office, which is where the... The old post office was, we're now CJ's garage is, and we sat there as the bus came and his duffel bag and he got on and he went away and was gone for a year and a half to the Philippines. Wow. So I remember him being away and we had quite a time during the war. Uh, he had put the car up on blocks before he left in an old barn that was out back here because you couldn't get tires and my mother didn't drive. Uh, we did go off to many trips to the PX with other wives that did drive around here with husbands in the service, and we'd drive all the way up to Camp Edwards at that time you know, to get wow. supplies. Wow. And that was before the mid cave, so it was a sizable drive, <laughs> just getting off the cave. Um, one summer during that war, my mother worked at the Acme Laundry in Chatham, and so we moved over there with another family that had a boy and a girl, and his mother knew my mother. And so the 
four kids and two mothers sort of camped together for the summer. And that's how we survived when the husbands were away at war and then came back. Um, after that, I remember my father you know, coming home and tearing down the old barn out back because it was this old decrepit barn. We had chickens in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now we've restored the property, but there's still foundations out here from farm buildings that go back hundreds of years at this point. I don't know what they were originally, but you'll right. find the stones in the ground. Did your family have what they called victory gardens during the war? Well, they must have. We always had a garden. It wasn't necessarily right. a victory garden. <laughs> well. But uh, no, we had a sizable garden out back. So we survived. You know, we had all the the corn, the squash, the, the radishes, and turps, and you know, everything growing there. Uh, was my job, we had the squash, and we'd put that in the bags and I'd hang it down in the winter in, in, the, in the basement. And bags of potatoes, we grew a lot of potatoes, and so we had all those essentials in the house. And of course, when my father was home, we always had fish and, and shellfish. Right. Um, in our early days, at that point when I mean, five years old or four years old, we had a skiff down the shore. We'd climb in that skiff, give it a push, and by the time it stopped, we could drop anchor. We were at the edge of the channel, and you could catch a bucket of flounder in no time. So we always had flounder, and of course, Jimmy Knowles' flat was down there, so we could dig cohogs. And that's on the map of... Explain that map a little That's bit. That's a map that shows all of the town landings and all of the named places on the marsh. Uh, you'll find uh, you know, the Doan Hummock, which is just a hunk of marsh that's near right. the direction of Doan Rock. Um, but that was done probably in those names go back into the 1850s at least. And the map was published in the mid-60s by the Cape Codder. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know when it was published. I know we've got one at some yep. point. So I have one at home and I have one here. It's uh, wonderful. People to. love it. It's at the archives. Okay. Um, that, that, that should be because it... Yeah. They're probably going to edit it now for some of the names that are on there. But, you know, <laughs> you know those are the names. That's right. The way it was. So uh, when did your father come back from the war? I remember another memory I have is VJ Day. That night... We all went up to the center of Orleans, and they had hung a stuffed dummy of a soldier up in the center, and there was noisemakers and band. I had a cowbell, I had a dinner bell, ringing between my legs, standing there on the corner across from the ship ahoy, which is now the land ho. Right. But I, you know, that was a big occasion, because that marked the end, and then it took him several months to get home. Because coming back on a troop ship that did about you know five knots, it took thirty days just to get from there back to the states. Wow! And then train across coming home. But when he was home, you know things began to to change again. You know I get to do more fishing, and there are, you know many things we did in those days. I remember things happening, um, like the Cape Ann scallop boat came ashore down north of Nasset Light. And that's a pretty high bluff down there at that point. And the locals are going down, helping them salvage the scallops and some of the equipment, but the boat was, was lost, I'm sure. Uh, we went down, and my father said, now, take your time, don't run. I took two steps and went head over heels all the way down that cliff. That <laughs> oh, <there>. no. <laughs> and they came rushing down to see if I was still breathing. And I got up and dusted off, and there was no much work for the wear. But that made an impression. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fast trip down. Um, another event at that time, the Long Street had been put out in the bay. And there were planes coming out of Quincy, practicing bombing, dropping smoke bombs for the most part. And so it was, you heard the planes, but you heard nothing else. Yeah. And then my father said, there's been an accident, let's go. We hopped in the car and we went down to Cooksbrook Beach. And the Coast Guard was coming ashore in the duck. And two planes had collided over the ship. One parachuted up, and one crashed, and then ended up there bringing the bodies ashore. Oh, at that I've point. never heard of that. So 
it, it's, it's the only event I know that, that happened with it at that time. Yeah. So at that point, I was getting ready to go to school. Um, I started school very early. I had just turned five when we went into the first grade. Everybody else, you know, there was no one within seven months of me. <laughs> uh, they were all turned six back in December or something, you know, or September. So I started school and went to the old, the, the, the new grammar school, which at that time had four rooms, four classes. We had, you know, two grades to a class. So Vesta Gould had the first and second. Uh, Della Maycomb next door had the third and fourth. Uh, Vesta Handel had the fifth and sixth. And Otto Nickerson was the principal and had the seventh and eighth grade. Well, we went there seven years and then transition was made to go to junior high in Orleans instead of just high school. So we did a, a one year transition. But I remember those days at the school, the things we did. Um, remember first grade, I just got a picture someplace, that shows us with a, uh, a setup for a store in the back of a you know, empty boxes that we brought in of cereal and other things. And that's how we learned math. They give some money, go back, and you had to make change. So you had to add up the bill and then pay and, and get change. That worked. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. But the other novel thing was having two classes to a room. So one would get a job and have to not pay attention, have to concentrate on what they were doing, while the class was doing something else. Uh, How many in a class? There were about 12 in hours, I mean, a large, mm -hmm. but, it was, but basically 20 to a room. Mm -hmm. So maybe 80 kids all together. Hmm. Um, it, was a, it was a good time. We, did, we were still had desks as we got to the seventh and eighth grade. We still had desks that we could sit individually with ink wells. And we had to make the ink. And we just didn't need water. We had to go down to Minister's Pond and get the pond water and bring it up to make the ink. So we did that, but of course, it was only about four years later that ball pen, pens became economical and you could actually yeah, yeah, get them yeah. in the early 50s that came out. Hmm. So we had those. Um, the other thing of the school was we were quite in tune with the times in terms of like celebrating Memorial Day. For Memorial Day, it was about the time of year when all the lilac bushes were blooming. So we'd all bring bouquets of lilacs to school and then we'd have a parade from the school, down the school road, around the corner, up Route 6, and across the street to the cemetery. <laughs> uh, traffic stopped, there was no problem in those days for doing that. And uh, I was in Cub Scouts, so I was carrying a flag. And we pulled into the cemetery, we stopped in front of the cemetery, and they're gonna play taps. So we, I dipped the flag, and they're ahead of me in the stone, is James H. Knowles. It was actually James Hatch Knowles was the name. And his first wife, Ruth Ann, who happened to be my first wife's name also. <laughs> so I thought it was predicting but, uh, <laughs> that you still drive by the day and I show everybody you know, what, what's there. Wow. How uh, old were you then, about? Oh, I was probably just seven. Seven. Yeah. Wow. Seven for scouts at that point. Yeah. One thing I didn't mention at grammar school is uh, the influence of the bank. When we were in the first grade, we had savings books. That's, and every week, they would come in and you took your dime, your quarter, whatever you had, and they'd deposit and put in the bank. That was where the five, you know, Cape Cod five. Um, when I was later working, when I was 14, earning more money, I put more money in the bank. And for, I think, every $50, we got a setting of silver plate silverware until I had a complete set, as does my wife, and we still use it every day. <laughs> so, it's, yeah, That's 65 fabulous. years later, we're eating with the same stuff that we got from the bank. That you so, earned. Yeah, well, we earned by saving. <laughs> yeah. I mean, those are the days where you bought gas and got green stamps or something. Right. right? So, at the bank, you got something else as part of the deal. And uh, it built you into a customer for life. Yeah. But another big event we had each year was the Christmas party. The, we went to the town hall, 
and I'll you know, put on a little show each grade would sing a song or do something. And then the janitor would come out dressed in Santa Claus, and there would be a present for every kid in town. So that was a quite a thing in those days doing yeah. that. Really made made sense. You remember that, Rick, don't you? Oh, I don't. You're kidding. No, I know you yeah. mentioned it before. Yeah, yeah, Roger mentioned it too. Yeah, we yeah. went there for that. The other thing we went there for after the dirt was dancing lessons, and we did square dancing at the town hall. Yes. And then probably a little bit of waltzing, but you know that was a you know, the days when they were still pretty young. Uh, about in the second grade, this, when I, I was seven years old, so I guess it was the end of second grade this time the next year, I got the paper out. Oh. I took it over from Eddie Maycumber, who was Della Maycumber, so ne lived next door. <laughs> he was about six years older than I was. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say, it went from the top of the hill, not, not Fort Hill, all the way to the Dairy Queen. I had a dog that went with me on the paper route. And I did the paper route by crisscrossing the street, going to the Dairy Queen, dropping off all customers, so I could ride straight home when I was done. On your bicycle? On my bike, <laughs> with a dog. And, you know, now when you look at Route 6 and see the traffic, you say, you know, how'd you ever make it? Well, uh, we could do it in those days. Was it profitable? I made enough money each week, yeah. To, People tipped well. I mean, it was probably, if I recall, it was 10 cents a day for the newspaper and 20 cents or something for Sunday's paper. Mm -hmm. you know, the and so I get a dollar or a dollar and a quarter from everybody. And so if I was, right. I'd, I'd make some a week. And each week, the, the newspaper guy would stop by and collect. And my mother had the bag of money on the table because he'd stop in and pay her. And that was it. Yeah. And it wasn't, it wasn't a year or more after that, I also started mowing lawns. I had a lawnmower in the summer. I ended up with, you know, six or eight lawns. Some far away that my father would drop the lawnmower off and I'd get my bike and ride there and mow the grass. Mm -hmm. So that's what you did until you were old enough to have some other job. And I did it until I became 14, at which point I could go to work officially and I did at a restaurant at the town center restaurant in East Town, which is one of the few that existed. But I got to wash dishes and peel potatoes. And the only thing they served was chicken pie dinners. So that meant I got there in the morning, I'd peeled about 100 pounds of potatoes, and then, stayed, and then washed the mess up for the rest of the day. <laughs> Explain for the viewers uh, where that town center restaurant town was. Town center is located right at the intersection of Brackett Road and Six. Uh, on the northeast corner. Wow. Yeah. 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 So it was there, and I pedaled my bike down there and pedaled home at night. You know, you know, summer was fun here. You know, you get my lawn done. I could hop on the bike and go down to salt pond swimming or the great pond. Uh, I mean, growing up around here, you were always outside. From the time I went to school and I came home at, from school. Come in, make yourself a sandwich, and then go outside and play until it was time to come in for dinner. And playing for me might be playing around here or going down to the cove, building a raft or doing something down there that I probably shouldn't have been doing, but <laughs> I didn't know how to swim until I was about eight. But yeah. my father never learned how to swim, so that didn't bother him. <laughs> and he went offshore fishing all the time. Uh, he said he wouldn't have the energy to swim ashore if he could, so he might as well go quick. <laughs> the answer. So those were some of the you know, early years on the Cape of doing that. I was uh, going to ask you, do you remember on your way down to the restaurant going by Gertrude's Beach Box? Was that there? Where Arnold's is now? It must have been. Yeah, remember? Yeah. Uh, you know, because you know, it was well before Arnold's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you don't remember it though, huh? I don't remember stopping at it. Yeah, yeah. It probably yeah. wasn't open when he rode oh, down on his well, bike and closed when he yeah, came back yeah. at it. The idea of going out and spending money on something like that, I didn't. The only money I ever spent was at the Dairy Queen from the Theater. <laughs> All right. And uh, in those days, shopping was at the Army Navy store. Right. In Orleans, you go for that. 
So that was quite a time. Um, I love these memories. It's just, it reminds me so much, of course, of our childhood, but we followed you by a decade. Yeah. Um, well, we so it's really, inter you know, the yeah. same teachers. The well, and in that decade, a lot of technology changed. Now, one of the things going back to during the war I didn't mention was all the convoys that went by going to Wellfleet. Oh. And there were um, tracked guns. So it looked like a tank, but it was just a, a big 155, you know, howitzer gun. And they would come down through here, and we'd always go out to wave. But those guns made everything in the house shake wow. going by, because they were heavy, and the troops always waving. And then when they're shooting, they're shooting off George, you can see the drone plane flying, pulling a target behind it, hoping they shot the right thing. But that went on. Wow. Uh, so. I'm, I'm going to suggest that we pause for a moment okay. and thank you very much so far okay. for this and we'll do part two in just a second. Okay.